Okay. All right, we're going to get started. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on a Friday, noon, East Coast time, morning, West Coast time. We have people from all over joining us today, and we're really excited to talk to you about the work that the Waterfront Alliance and many other people are doing to unlock potential for on-water recreation especially applicable to urban areas and urban areas that are still transforming and recovering in many ways from their industrial past. So I'm Courtney Worrell and I'm the president of the Waterfront Alliance and I welcome you to today's webinar. So um, our title is Unlocking Potential, Evaluating Sites for On-Water Recreation. And the next slide shows that we're joined by a number of very, uh, really important people that we work with. You can go to the next slide. Uh, that are going to be presenting today as part of this webinar. So first is Farhana Husseini, who is our Director of Programs and Climate Initiatives. Next is Ray Fusco, the owner of Hudson and founder of Hudson Canyon Consulting. Michael Johnson, uh, co-founder and board member of South Bronx Unite. And Annette Pierce, who's co-leader of Cat Kayak Staten Island. So I think we're having trouble with our PowerPoint. And so... I think that means that I should probably share my screen. So let me do that if I can. Um, and I will go to right here. So does everybody see the slide? Can I see a nod? Of, nod no slides are seen? From Farhana, can you say yes or no? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So these are our speakers today at our webinar. Um, and I'll just do a little introduction and then I'll pass it along to Farhana to get us started into the content. But to, for those of you who may not know, Waterfront Alliance is a New York, New Jersey organization working also across the country on all things waterfronts, coastlines, lake uh, lakefronts and riverine environments. Together, we build, transform, revitalize and protect accessible waterfronts for all communities. And today's agenda, we're going to be talking about the work that the Waterfront Alliance has been doing now for a long time, uh, but consolidated our work on opening public access and recreation to waterfronts across New York and New Jersey, the way we've done this work for the last three and a half or four years. And what that has centered on is figuring out a couple really important things. One is that we can't have on water recreation everywhere, um, either because it just isn't feasible to do it for one reason or another, existing industrial uses, the safety, um, like shipping channel related safety issues, et cetera. It can also have to do with the lack of funding that there is for certain locations in the city. Often the funding is going to open, the funding that is going to open up recreation or waterfront improvements for communities is going to the wealthiest communities. By far, that's been the experience in New York um, with lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge Park in particular being the great examples of that, while the other boroughs of New York City and the many, many communities that would benefit from on-water recreation have almost no access and no improvements, and in some cases, no improvements to their waterfronts for decades. And we're talking since the last ship left in the 1970s when when most of the shipping was con was consolidated into the port terminals of New York and New Jersey. So with all of these different constraints but also opportunities and needs, how does how does one decide where to put their efforts and how do we decide where to target and focus where the emphasis should be in investment and time and funding in on water recreation? What locations and what are the criteria that we use for making those decisions? And that's what today is all about. So we're gonna talk about the need for evaluating potential sites for on-water recreation. Why do we need to evaluate them? How do we do the prioritization and why does that matter? We're gonna talk about the evaluation criteria that Waterfront Alliance used. We're gonna talk about the final sites that we ended up selecting as our own to prioritize the Waterfront Alliance energy and, and resources behind and mostly staff time in terms of supporting organizations that were already in locations where there was a lot of demand and opportunity and it, and it met the criteria that we had originally established. And we'll talk about the case studies of two of those sites, Lincoln Avenue Street End in the Bronx and Front Street North Shore of Staten Island. So just a quick primer, we have 
at least six long presentations we could do on this topic, which is the history of the New York City and New Jersey waterfront. But to make a very, very long and interesting short, uh, to make a very, very long and interesting story short, I will just say that with the with the leaving of ind industry and manufacturing, and in many ways shipping, we built ways of blocking people from the water. And that is, that's a legacy that has been with, with the, the New York, New Jersey region since the 1940s. And part of the reason why we wanted to block ourselves off from, from the water was because the Clean Water Act hadn't been kicked into gear yet. The water smelled, it was dirty, it was polluted, nobody wanted to be near it. And our built environment reflects that, turning our back to the water and staying away from it for many, many reasons, which are, were in fact good reasons. And this is what we have. This is a view of the Harlem River. And you can see that it is completely blocked. I think this is the Harlem River and it's completely blocked off. There's very, very little access available in any of these locations. But what Waterfront Alliance and others have been doing, but I'd like to say that Waterfront Alliance is re really leading the charge. We've been working with developers, private and public, to develop waterfront sites in a way that integrates opportunities for on-water recreation, access, education, community benefits, so that we're no longer walled off. The Clean Water Act has been one of the greatest environmental victories in the United States, if not in the world, as an example of one country that got it right. We got it right. And so let's take advantage of that and have the access to the water that we all deserve. So anyway, that's the history in a nutshell. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Farhana who will talk about how, we did our, how we've organized and done our work. So go ahead, Farana. Great, thank you so much, Courtney, and thanks for teeing us up in that way. Um, you know, what we uh, what we essentially have, have understood and, and, and sort of the, the founding idea that we are, are sort of sitting upon is this idea that access to water is, is incredibly critical across New York City, as Courtney mentioned, it's been historically limited to a select few neighborhoods. It is really critical that uh, that everyone has access to on-water activities due to its numerous benefits. And if you can just go go to the next slide, I believe. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so for young people, for example, it offers unique opportunities for STEM programming, things like citizen science activities, which you know, fosters uh, curiosity and learning. Um, additional direct access to the water can really significantly improve sort of physical, mental health, well-being. It provides recreational activities that promotes fitness and reduces stress. And I think we all need a little bit of that every now and then. Um, you know, these benefits it really do extend to the broader community by creating vibrant public spaces that enhance social cohesion and foster a sense of belonging. Um, this is also incredibly critical, and particularly in spaces in New York City, um, where social cohesion and community building is, is, uh, is so far and few between. Um, moreover, public access does really play a crucial role in environmental stewardship, um, right? When people start engaging directly with the water, they develop a sense of ownership and responsibility to their local environment, and it promotes all types of conservation efforts. Um, it is essential to ensure that access is provided in safe spaces as well. Um, and so, you know, when we're starting to look at spaces around New York City, you know, really thinking about what access can look like for industrial waterfronts, for example. Um, and so this webinar will uh, will delve into sort of the various factors uh, that that must be considered uh, to evaluate the appropriate type of access for different parcels of land, um, but also ensuring that you know access is safe uh, and beneficial for the community and and the environment. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so here we we really do understand that New York City's waterfront is essentially a huge network of parks and open spaces that sort of stretches across all five boroughs, um, and it's a it's a network for well known parks like Brooklyn Bridge Park, as as Courtney mentioned earlier, and Hudson River Park, um, but it's also 
There's also less formal spots like street ends and vacant lots by the water. Um, and many of these, uh, many of the sort of big improvements that have happened along these spaces have happened in wealthier neighborhoods with more political influence, um, leaving, you know, many informal access points sort of fenced off and close to the public. Um, and we'll hear a lot more about that in the two case studies that we'll, we'll explore. Um, but despite this, you know, local groups like Kayak Staten Island and South Bronx Unite have, uh, have stepped up to take care of these areas, um, showing how important the community is in maintaining and advocating for these spaces. Um, so in the past few years, Waterfront Alliance has, has essentially taken a study to identify and develop action plans for city-owned sites to be transformed into accessible waterfronts, but particularly in historically disinvested communities. Um, these, the, this study essentially evaluated 60 sites based on various criteria, um, including the lack of waterfront access, ease of access, current management, required investments, safety concerns, and, and community and interest. Um, we also looked at uh, things like community communities um, demographic makeup, income levels, climate change risks to ensure equity in waterfront access. Um, and then by engaging with partners uh, like South Bronx Unite and Kayak Staten Island, um, you know, we we essentially developed action plans to invest in things like waterfront education, environmental programming, and recreation in underserved communities. Um, We'll dive into this criteria, and uh, and what I'd love to do now is essentially pass it off to one of the architects of of the uh, of the report and of this plan, uh, Ray Fusco. Thanks for and the next slide, David. Perfect. Thank you so much. Excited to be here to speak to you. Um, so the criteria for site selection we used a variety of open source data sets uh, from one from the CDC and their social vulnerability index. The other was a US Census opportunity analysis, uh, opportunity atlas data. And then also we reviewed uh, the New York City Planning Department's community district profiles. And we aggregated all of that data into some ranking systems to review sites around the city. Um, once we got to a short list, we talked to community partners. We had community partner conversations. Uh, we did surveys with community residents, and we also did quite a few uh, physical site scouts at locations to see what the actual uh, situation looked like. And then we developed our short list of sites that met many conditions that we had set up for success to name sites in underserved communities. Next slide. So we looked at this holistically and we're trying to take a look at the city as an interconnected city, talking about the waterways as connected tissues to different locations. And we looked at the density of access sites, and we looked at a set of systems that are currently in place, like the system and series of boathouses around New York City, the water trail system, and other locations to sort of create this interconnected system to allow access to to locations that would then foster access to other locations on adjacent water bodies or adjacent neighborhoods. So the Harlem River is a perfect example of this. There may be an access point in Manhattan, but you can't get across the Harlem River to an access point in the Bronx. And so we were looking at different uh, ideas and constructs of that nature to help identify sites that would help with that interconnectedness and that holistic approach to the city and this connected tissue. Um, Next slide, please. Great, so based on those community profiles and the social vulnerability criteria, the CDC data specifically looks at the democratic, uh, demographic and socioeconomic factors that adversely affect communities. And they had a ranking system that we reviewed for that. Um, we also used the Opportunity Atlas and that uh, census data took a look specifically at people who were able to rise out of poverty and then track back to where they grew up to see if there were specific programs or systems in that community that helped them rise out of poverty. And then within the community district profiles, um, this set of data from city planning was really interesting because they talked about things such as proximity to parks, household income, race and Hispanic origin, 
uh, data population by age. And it kind of gave a, an, an interesting overview of the built environment. And these community district profiles were based on the 59 uh, community boards that are around in and around New York City. So that was interesting to weave into the Opportunity Atlas and the Social Vulnerability Index. Also within that data is a specific New York City poverty measure, which takes into account the um, expense of housing, which is different from a national uh, poverty level. And so together we built all these, together we compiled all of this information and had a ranking system to, to see what sites would rise to the top. Uh, next slide, please. So as a, as a sample methodology, and I'm using again the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, we took a look at the 2018 overall uh, social, vulner social Vulnerability Index score. And as CDC ranks it inside their data set, 0.75 to high is the highest vulnerability. And 0.0 to 0.25 was their lowest vulnerability. So throughout the different pieces of data, we picked out a desired range. And in this particular data set, we designated the desired range as 0.5 or higher as the range we were looking for, for sites to rise to the top or to be listed in the short list. And this small um, table, which is probably hard to read for many, kind of gives an overview of some of the other data points of data that we used and some of the desired ranges that we put together to have uh, an objective, as an objective as possible scoring system to help us uh, rank sites. Next slide. So the physical site selection criteria came down to a few things. It was kind of a blended approach of uh, safety and the complexities of the C state, and then also community interest repairs and long-term management. And as I mentioned earlier, the density of access sites. So safety is pretty straightforward. Um, how much commercial traffic and recreational traffic takes place? Are there any hazards or anything in the water? Of course, tides and currents uh, play a specific role and a unique role throughout the city, but in different locations, they may be accentuated based on the contours and geography of the site. Community interest. Community interest is really critical in any of these efforts, programming through community partners is critical. It's why we have Kayak Staten Island and South Bronx Unite here today because of their, their significant community contributions. And of course, upgrading the site. What does it take to upgrade it? What is the cost? And then long-term management, You know, unfunded mandates of access points with no community stewards or budgets to fund them long-term creates challenges because then who takes care of the long-term maintenance? You know, all of these pieces came together in our criteria and selections. Uh, next. So we talked about this a little bit, uh, safety, tides and currents, vessel traffic. You know, we live in, we live, work and play in this port environment, the largest port in the nation right now. And it's a shared mixed use port. We have a thriving ferry system. We have a strong tug and barge system that heads up the Hudson River as well as out to Long Island Sound. We've got commercial container ships coming in. And we also have a thriving recreational community. So sailing lessons, sailing schools, human powered boating, a variety of different boathouses. So all these have to coexist. And in that coexistence is trying to be smart about locations and their proximity to some of this interchange. And, and what does that look like? And how do we carefully plan that? And so not ruling anything out, but certainly trying to be smart and careful and thoughtful about different types of programming that could be better suited at locations, uh, at some locations rather than other locations. So we had ranking and scoring for that as well. And of course, you know, had a really blended approach to that, making sure that we had a matrix to sort of talk to that. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so the, the physical site selection, as I mentioned earlier, so some sites like in Kayak Staten Island and on North Shore of Staten Island was a sloping sandy beach, kind of deteriorated parking lot area that would lend itself to a fairly straightforward and easy construction and cost of construction process. Um, other sites have a much more costly construction uh, price tag. They have challenges, potential challenges with permitting, 
what kind of overwater coverage and what's the timeline for permitting for certain constructions. And then of course, the long-term maintenance. So we took a look at those. Again, we created a ranking system around uh, the costs and the challenges and the time it would take to uh, bring a site online for access. Next slide. And then the four sites that we chose uh, out of the 10, as Farhana mentioned, we had around 60 that we found that could be potential. And then we created a shorter list of 10, and then we created this final list of four that really rose to the top. Um, one, because the community partners, but also they were ripe for uh, what we thought was a fairly quick and not incredibly expensive cost to open access. Um, those are Borden Avenue Street End uh, along Dutch Kills, and there our partner was the Newtown Creek Alliance. Uh, this is an interesting site. I'll briefly mention that it's half skateboard park that's shepherded by this really great skateboarding community, and the other half is water access. And so it's this great, uh, really unique street end that doesn't get used that was a site that uh, came to the top. Big Rock Beach in Flushing, and our partner there is Coastal Preservation Network. Um, it's a site that they do cleanups at and do some programming at currently. And so it would really be just the process of hopefully, you know, bringing it online. And then, of course, Lincoln Avenue, we have South Bronx United to speak to that today. Um, and Front Street parking lot, North Shore Staten Island with Kayak Staten Island. I think I'm handing this over to Farhana here. Um, four great sites that you know came to the top and excited to be talking about the two that we've chosen for today's webinar. Awesome. I appreciate this, right? I would I just have one question for you, um, just for clarification. Um, so you've you shared that these four sites bubbled up to the top. I'm curious about what what were the criteria that essentially allowed for these four sites to bubble up to the top? Can you go into a little bit of that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the first things is the community interest and the community partner. Um, opening access only uh, works long term if you've got a strong community advocate that can make it work. So I think that's number one on the site on for the sites. Um, I think the second was the ease with which we felt they could be opened and that certainly like in Big Rock Beach, there's already been several cleanups that lend itself to opening access to it. There would be very little, um, there'd be very little needed from a construction standpoint to get that site up and running. Uh, similar to the Front Street parking lot and the sloping shoreline that just needs some modest uh, repairs. Um, and yeah, Lincoln Avenue, South Bronx United has been a long time steward in promoting their waterfront plan some 15 years, I think, 10 or plus 15 years. Michael will speak to that. But yeah, um, as well as other scoring. But I would say that the ease of ease of of access ease of creation of access and then the community partner were probably the two biggest criteria and factors that help bring those to the top. That's really helpful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Ray. And thank you for sharing the extensive criteria that is used uh, in order to figure out which sites are, are sort of should be prioritized uh, uh, moving forward in, in New York City. Um, Wonderful. Well, on the next slide, um, I would love to welcome Michael Johnson, um, from who is the co-founder and board member of South Bronx Unite, to uh, to share more about the uh, the case study of Lincoln Avenue. Thank you, Verhana, and also thank you, Ray and Courtney and Waterfront Alliance for uh, allowing me to join this this discussion and for choosing Lincoln Avenue Street and as one of the of uh, the prioritized projects um, for you all. You know, as Ray mentioned, this has been something our community has been envisioning to activate for a number of decades, um, way beyond uh, the origination of my organization, South Bronx Unite. Um, this has been um, really a highlighted space because of its underutilized access, um, underutilized abilities of what can be there. Um, right now, it's 
being used as a cross for a cross a crossing for a CSX rail line, which comes from the waste management facility, which uh, operates and handles most of the Bronx waste, and not all in some of Manhattan's. But it's a key location because it's one of the only two access points that you can actually, from the community, get to the water's edge because of the development um, that's taken place along the 106 acres of our peninsula. So Lincoln Avenue Street and it's, it's a really unique location. Uh, you know, it's close proximity to the community, which is only a couple blocks away, but also it's a site for um, where Sandy actually breached our shores at low tide and inundated our community with four feet of water. Um, we knew how important um, before um, Sandy of having access for a community of about 60,000 people who have no access to their peninsula, um, who only has one park really for all 60,000 people. But then after Sandy, we saw how important it was for us to buckle down, create a plan to create resiliency um, to make sure we can protect ourselves from storm surge and sea level rise. Because um, that was not and had not been any plan for protecting the community until the community came together and envisioned um, that 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 uh, this project and this plan to connect uh, not only Lincoln Avenue, but other connecting pathways throughout that peninsula to protect the community from in protect the community from inundation, but also provide quality of life. Thanks so much, Michael. I think on the on the next slide, um, you'll see some of the uh, you'll see the the community envisioning um, of the South Bronx Unite Waterfront Plan. Would you be able to share a little bit more about this? I, I would. I'd, be, I'd love to. Um, you know, this is a pretty old rendering of uh, the left side. It's one of the original uh, uh, renderings or photos of what our plan would look like. Uh, pretty rudimentary after we look at where we've gone. We've 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 done a lot of advancements over the years in terms of how we can best tell our story because of collaboration with institutions, with Waterfront Alliance and many others, how we've been better able to show exactly the possibilities here. But the Lincoln Avenue site is C on that list or on that map uh, to your left. Um, and it, what it shows you is G is the connecting green pathway um, throughout the entire peninsula. But if you see that um, that area there is called the Hollow River Yards. It's a plot of land that was leased uh, in 1991, I believe, for 99 years. But, but the locations that we have identified in our plan were underutilized and are still are pretty much underutilized other than maybe one site, which was built on. Um, so these C and D are run parallel to each other. And that C site is, again, only blocks away from some of the highest concentration of public housing in the city. So that probably the second largest uh, concentration of public housing. Um, you know, where folks in our community have been suffering with a lot of, you know, uh, environmental health related illnesses um, and recreation is super important. And so getting them close to the water and, and if not in the water, but very close to the water, we knew it was vital. And so we brought the community together to actually do asset mapping to identify because they're the experts who live here. I live in this community as to what spaces and places along this peninsula could be actually activated. And what what made sense? And and you know, when you look at the flood map to the right, um, we saw you know vul the vulnerability of our community, and we need to do something to protect some sixty thousand people who live within blocks from this flood zone. Really helpful, Michael. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. I think it's a uh, it's it's really inspiring uh, to to sort of see the way South Bronx Unite has brought together. It, it is both a community-led organization, but it's also bringing together communities. It's a space where, where communities come together um, to uh, to share what they what they would like to see along their waterfronts. And uh, and I think it's a very it's an incredible model um, for for moving forward. Um, on on the next slide, you can actually see uh, some of the sites that you were <clears throat> that you were talking about. I don't know if you would want to share a little bit more about some of the uh, the spaces here. Yeah, I would love to, thank you. Uh, the Bronx Kill, uh, the first slide to your left, is actually a waterway that divides the South Bronx from Randall's Island. Um, this is a very uh, n a shallow waterway, which we had been using for decades to actually launch canoes and get folks on the water, but we had to go to Randall's Island to do it. Um, and the years back, before we had the Randall's Island connector, we had to go across the RFK Bridge, formerly known as the Triborough Bridge. 
um, not very ease of access, right? And but this this area is we know is a vital resource, and you know the own that's the actual connecting waterway between the East River and the Harlem River at the very southernmost tip of the South Bronx, uh, and along that area and that the the peninsula of Water's Edge, you find the next slide or the next image, Park Avenue launch area. Sorry, it's my puppy barking. Um, she wants attention. Uh, Park Avenue boat launch area. Um, that's one of the only very few areas that does not have what's considered the Oak Point, La Oak, Oak Point uh, Link, um, operated by CSX. I think I mentioned that to you about Lincoln Avenue. Uh, all the water areas, uh, shoreline areas from Lincoln Avenue, up and past um, or up to Roberto Clemente State Park are blocked, all communities are blocked by this rail line that handles waste and other material and goods. But the communities are not allowed or not close to that water's edge as we are at Lincoln Avenue or at Park Avenue, which actually sits and actually goes on the other end of the other, it's the only land area in our peninsula that you can actually not have to cross the railroad track. The train goes in a different direction. It goes where you can actually get to without, like Lincoln Avenue, to the water's edge without being totally blocked, you know. And the Lincoln Avenue site, uh, which we discussed, has been in deterioration for a number of decades. Uh, that area does not look like it looks right now on that on that slide. It's actually breaking off into the Harlem River. Um, so when you have a community that's shouldering a burden for the Bronx, all the Bronx ways, um, the, the the generation of electric power or power generation with peaker plants that are also on our peninsula and heavy diesel truck intensive operations to leave green spaces and opportunities like these to deteriorate in the state they have over decades led us to start creating what you see in terms of that rendering on the next slide of how people can actually get to the water's edge and do something different, right? And really feel um, the benefit of being close to water and, and in green uh, recreational space that's also protecting them. Um, from sea level rise. Thank you for sharing, Michael. I'm I'm curious. Um, you've you've shared a really good sort of sense of where along the the water's edge um, is appropriate for on water recreation. Um, I'm curious about what are what are some of the obstacles that you've had um, in getting this waterfront plan completed. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I just want to go back. You know, the plan was prioritized by the state of New York Department of Environmental Conservation in 2016. And we've been working to actually activate a prioritized project. As you mentioned in the earlier of this presentation, other prioritized projects didn't have to go through this much um, deliberation to activate. Um, you've mentioned Brooklyn Bridge Park and several other waterways. We have the Little Island. They're not prioritized projects, but they are sites that were developed pretty quickly when there was political will and resources bearing down on creating these access points for people who are more economically affluent. Um, I don't think there's been a really rush to do that in, in our area. And that's why we've been really organizing our electeds around the need for this kind of balance approach to health and access and equity to, to green space and to, water's edge, to the water's edge. But the barrier has been financing, it has been the political will, and it also has been the number of different entities that have been playing in terms of agencies that have some sort of um, crossover ownership of various sites, especially Lincoln Avenue. But we've been navigating that and we've been you know, trying to really uh, build out that kind of collaboration with these agencies and we have done so in the last decade. And now we're moving more closer than we ever have been to activating Lincoln Avenue and other parcels along that, the waterfront plan. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for the work that South Bronx Unite does for uh, for the communities of South Bronx. It's uh, it's it's really, as I said earlier, it's really inspiring. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful way for other organizations that that are advocating for uh, for waterfront access um, to be essentially looking at as, as a as a model for moving forward. So, thank you, thank you again for for sharing and for and for being here today as well. Um, with that, I, I'd love to I'd love to now turn to another inspiring organization uh, who's been doing incredible work along Front Street. Um, Annette Pierce has is the uh, is the co-leader of Kayak Staten Island. 
a completely volunteer organization um, that that serves and correct me if I'm wrong, but has it serves almost 800 ki uh, kayakers uh, per year. Is is that right? Yeah. Bigger years. Yes. Amazing. Incredible, incredible work. Um, Annette, I'd love, I'd love for you to, I'd love for you to share some of the, uh, the, the work that you've been doing as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, and thank you so much for having me, Frahana. And thank you, Ray. Uh, Michael, it's fantastic to learn more about what you do. Um, and I'm definitely taking notes down here in Staten Island. Would love to connect with you more. So, Kayak Staten Island has been in existence since 2007. So I'm really proud of us because we really are just a small little urban kayaking nonprofit that is all neighbor run. So we're all lay people. And the slide says 2008. I'm sorry I didn't catch that before for Hana, but yeah, 2007. Um, and it's correct in saying that we are an equity mission at heart. Um, so Kayak Sat Down was founded by my predecessor, Katina Johnstone. And it was taken over by Jackie Crow, who was fantastic. And then when she unfortunately passed away, I've had the honor of taking it over with my co-director, James Limperopoulos, here today. But yeah, we are definitely just kind of some ragtag lay people out here doing the best we can, you know, for our communities, for our neighbors, for the environment, for the waterfront. And so, as you can see, um, we operate out of two sites. And what's particularly interesting about running something like this in Staten Island is the um, terrain, you know, and talking geographically and also socially and demographically. So these two sites that you see that we operate, um, 850 Page Avenue is all the way down on the south shore of Staten Island, southernmost point in New York State. Um, wildly different demographic than our site at 777 Front Street. So we have had the honor as an organization of being able to cover the entire island at this point. We started actually in Mid Island in um, Midland Beach and South Beach. And originally why we had moved from that spot and ended up at our uh, site uh, at 850 Page Avenue is because it was just very labor intensive to run programming from the site at South Beach. And um, there was damage incurred by Hurricane Sandy. Like we definitely feel you there, Michael. Um, Staten Island was very, very heavily impacted by Hurricane Sandy, including our launch sites. And so our good friend, John Kilcullen down at Conference House Park was able to uh, give us a sort of semi-secluded little enclave down in Tottenville on uh, Page Avenue. And so that has been our permanent storage site and kind of our home base ever since. And so while it is, you know, very different from the communities that we are talking about mostly in this webinar, um, our site at Page Avenue is really important to us because it gives us a unique opportunity. And I think it's unique, especially as compared to a lot of the rest of the city to have a really, really accessible launch point for kiddos, for children, for families, for absolute beginners, for um, folks with disabilities. We recently had a um, completely blind man go out on a public paddling date with us at our site at 850 Page Avenue. Um, we have a young man with special needs whose family has trusted us for years to be able to kind of offer an adaptive paddling experience for him. Um, so that, you know, while it is in a neighborhood that is economically pretty well healed, um, it does still allow us the opportunity to do our equity work, you know, and really, really fulfill our mission of, I like how Farhana put it, you know, social cohesion and community building. Because, you know, as for my background, I actually have more of a background in working with communities, working in social justice, I like to say community is my medium. Um, so down in Tottenville, we do have that opportunity to make what we do accessible to a lot of people and to as many of our neighbors and community members as we can. Um, and what's really fun about Tottenville too is getting to see the diverse communities that live down there come out and paddle together. So that is something that I've been very proud of. James and I have made a concerted effort to foster that safety um, and that that welcoming environment that we are for neighbors by neighbors, everybody's welcome. We're all getting our butts wet together and that's that's what we're doing. So um, as for our site at Front Street, um, there are so many reasons, you know, obviously the Waterfront Alliance has their rubrics and why they chose it. Um, 
So in Staten Island, the terrain is very unique because there is a wealth of water access in Mid Island and South Shore. Um, there's a paucity of water access on the North Shore, and that is what we are hoping to to mitigate, and that's what we're working towards. So our site at Front Street, you know, um, Ray, I forget how you described it, kind of like a, a urban parking lot in gentle need of maybe a little bit of refining. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we picked that spot is because I kind of lovingly call it a chunky urban parking lot, but it, it does have a relatively, actually has a quite safe egress. Um, we've never had an issue, thank goodness. Um, but it is something that, you know, the lay person can come and get in a kayak and launch from there. So that is an extremely important consideration for us. We have an impeccable safety record and we want to keep it that way. Um, but really one of the things that kind of clinched that spot for us too was a partnership with um, Makerspace, you know, because one of the unique kind of challenges that we've had is um, in establishing kind of a North Shore launch site is a lack of permanent storage. So thankfully our friends at Makerspace have a park. We were able to store our kayaks. It was a little bit unwieldy to have to kind of tow our kayaks about a quarter mile down the road to, to launch it. Um, but it was kind of the best that we could do. Um, that site is on DCAS land. I think you're all familiar with DCAS, um, the Department of City Administrative Services. So we weren't able to actually place any permanent storage there yet. We're working on it. So in the interim, that sort of um, arrangement of being able to tow our kayaks down to that site. So neighbors on the North, on the North Shore could access the water in their neighborhood. Um, it's been working, <laughs> we've been making it work. Um, so that was one of the key factors and why we chose that spot. Um, you know, the reason we didn't go further North um, is because that kind of abuts maritime industry in a way that we don't feel is tenable and safe for a public kayaking program. Um, Fantastic visibility at that launch site. While it is in the New York Harbor, it's a, you know it's a busy waterway. Um, we do not have to take members of the public anywhere near the actual active shipping channel. We have incredible north-south visibility, so really very safe. Um, and that is you know paramount. Um, it's easily accessible by car too. You know what we have to consider in Staten Island, especially. Um, as we really want to have a presence and be accessible to neighbors in disinvested neighborhoods is we would like to ensure there's access by car, but also by public transit. And so that site at Front Street is accessible by bus, by train, by car, there's parking. So it minimizes portage, you know, for anybody that may be able to bring their own boat or our volunteers that are bringing their own boats. So that's been a key consideration for us. Um, we wanted to look at sites with few to no underwater obstructions, because sometimes those things can hide from you. Um, we love launching from Bono Beach at Alice Austin House when we can. There's some sort of things along that shoreline there just underwater that we have to consider that aren't quite as prevalent at our site on Front Street. Um, we want accessibility by EMS in the event of a sort of an unexpected exigency, as we call it, um, has never happened, thankfully, but, you know, that is a consideration for us, for sure. Um, and close proximity to stuff, you know, whether it be food, whether it be somewhere to go drink after, whether it be um, hardware stores, bathrooms, that sort of thing, um, you know, until we have sort of our own boathouse and our own facilities, perhaps down there, um, access to all those things are really important. And then, you know, um, what Frahano was saying earlier, like so much of what we do is to really get people to care personally about their waterfronts and about their neighborhoods. And, you know, you can kind of talk at people about big things like um, climate change and environmental stewardship, but until a person has really um, experienced their waterway in a way that inspires them to care personally because it's so beautiful, because it's so accessible, because look, it is in your neighborhood. It is for you too. There's really no reason why you should not be able to like access this and enjoy your island and enjoy your water. Um, that really gets people to care and that really gets people to hopefully take steps to do more to protect, you know, the water and to, um, care about environmental stewardship. So we picked a beautiful spot. All that preamble to say, we picked an absolutely beautiful spot, I think, to run a public program. The views of Manhattan are unique. The views of the Verrazano Bridge are unique. Um, you know, it's kind of cool to be paddling, you know, in 
very safe proximity to the tankers and like the the commercial maritime traffic out there. Um, and it's just it's really beautiful, especially at sunset. Um, we'd love our neighbors to be able to experience their island and their neighborhood in that way. I think it's essential. Um, I think I hit all the major points about why we love our spot, but I think really our our main aim right now is to ensure that neighbors in the North Shore of Staten Island uh, enjoy the same water access as their neighbors in Mid Island and the South Shore. It's really very important. It's important to us that we make an opportunity available to folks who um, historically are less able to have their own car, to transport a boat, to have space to store one, to be able to afford a boat, um, because this really should be for everybody. Thank you so much, Annette, and and really, really appreciate again the work that that Kayak Staten Island is doing, and uh, and ensuring that you know all communities are getting access to the same the same things across New York City, and and uh, and appreciate I, I really much you know very appreciate some of the uh, the work that that you and Annette particularly and you and James are doing um, to ensure that in your spare time. <laughs> thousands of of, uh, of of people are getting onto the water um i just have i have one follow-up question annette for you um would love to hear more about some of the obstacles similar to to michael um some of the obstacles that you're facing right now along uh, along front street sure um so right now the north shore of staten island is, is a very dynamic area um there has been a lot of shoreline beautification. Um, there is new development happening on the North Shore right now. So bureaucratically, it's very dynamic to try to do our best as an organization and as a um, you know an organization that is really out to serve our neighbors and communities first. And we know we're on the same page as our legislators and you know everybody that's doing work in the area to um, make sure that our, to ensure that we are showing them that we fully support them and are on the same page as them by ensuring that our neighbors on the North Shore have access to the water, you know, that it's not just to look at, um, that we're kind of on par with other, all the other boroughs in the city that have their own boat houses. You know, we want the same for our community. So we want to ensure that we're working with you know, DCAS with the EDC, with, you know, um, City Council Member Hanks and all the legislators in the area to just get out there and do what is best for our communities and for our North Shore neighbors. So um, it's been a little hard with, I think, um, Michael, you you used a term that I related to and I, I wrote it down. Um, here's the well, anyway, the point is, is, you know, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, everybody's working together, you know, um, and so that has been probably our, our biggest difficulty, especially with active construction happening, too. Um, there's been some inadvertent restriction of our North Shore launch site, so some halting in our programming there. Um, Kayak Staten Island is amply prepared to launch at alternate sites starting next season. We actually got some grant funding to um, get some infrastructure that will ensure that we maintain our impeccable safety records so we can continue to take our North Shore neighbors and community members paddling safely. Um, just adjacent to our current site that is that is restricted until construction is done. So um, I don't know if I'm being entirely clear about that, but yeah, it just is kind of some bureaucratic dynamism, some administrative Holdups. Why we all ensure that we're on the same page, serving the community out on the water, and also um, supporting you know the beautification and development that's happening on the North Shore. I appreciate you sharing that, Annette. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you both, Michael and Annette, for for sharing you know the uh, the these important case studies with us. Um, on on the next slide, you'll you'll sort of now begin to sorry not this. On the next slide. Um, and on the next slide, <laughs> uh, 
Perfect. <laughs> um, so, well, you know, the idea behind both South Bronx and, and the North Shore of Staten Island, you know, it, it is both sites are sort of located in communities with moderate to high social vulnerability. You know, both sites are highlighting the importance of equity in their development. Um, and, you know, really both sites have very limited waterfront, proper waterfront access. Um, but what we also see here is that there's two strong organizations that are taking a community driven approach to really ensuring that residents have a voice in shaping the future of their waterfronts. And, um, you know, by, by prioritizing these two, you know, these two underserved areas, as well as others, you know, around New York City, uh, we really do hope to transform a lot of these spaces into accessible waterfronts that provide recreational, educational and environmental benefits to everyone. Um, but I think what is also really important is that these are two examples of where on water access needs to and should be prioritized, um, but not all sort of areas are, are created equal. Um, and so on the next slide, um, I'd actually love to ask you, Ray, you know, what, what are some considerations to sites um, to establish on water recreation? Well, I think if you're comparing a busy industrial site versus a sloping shoreline, as in the photo on the right, then um, I think inherently some of this is crystal clear. Um, you know, the square footage needed for industrial sites to move aggregate or containers or to have cranes and other things, it's precious space that's needed to move volume through the port complex. And I think taking away any square footage from an industrial site to create a launch or a landing or someplace is tricky. Just the cost of real estate in that particular environment is tough. Um, we do have um, throughout the larger port, say, you know, global port of New York and New Jersey, waters of New York City and New Jersey, we do have mixed use. And there are locations where a human power boating site is directly adjacent or close to um, a maritime site, I think with a lot of careful planning and with a lot of understanding and knowledge and knowledge sharing, you get to know what's happening at the site so you can plan for vessel traffic and um, be prepared to interact safely and carefully. But I think overall, you know, that takes some time and some planning. And I think um, given, as Courtney mentioned earlier in the conversation, how most of the containerized uh, shipping moved to singular port complexes, um, it has been localized. And I think those are important to maintain. We have precious few uh, at SMIAs, uh, I'm forgetting what the acronym stands for now, but um, these are, you know, specialized or specialized maritime industrial areas. Significant. Um, significant. What is it? Significant. significant. Uh, so, so that I mean, that's that's important to have and important to maintain. Uh, moving things by water can often be, uh, say, uh, more cost effective, and we should maintain that as a port. Um, I think it's part of the history of New York City um, is having an industrial maritime complex. Um, so, not every site is perfect for having. Um, uh, an access site. I think uh, Annette said it best, you know, there are maritime partners to the north and to the south. There's a very busy and very uh, prominent uh, Miller's Launch has a very prominent site further north of them, but it's much further north and there's a big open embayment with plenty of line of sight, like she said, north and south, and you can coexist easily. I think it's all about just, you know, planning and uh, being smart about best use, highest and best use, use uses of those sites. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Ray. And and I, I do appreciate what you're saying here and, and going into the next slide. Um, you know, one of the things that Waterfront Alliance has done is uh, is we've created a report um, on how to do this well. <laughs> and it's uh, it's really, you know, trying to, there's many different case studies on how um, public access can be creatively to, right to your point, um, you know, be integrated into industrial sites to ensure that we are still thinking about things that 
can provide value to communities um, in a safe way. Um, and then with that, I do want to save some time for for some Q and A. Um, so I'll I'll pass it off to uh, to Courtney uh, to uh, to take us through some of the the questions that have been uh, been raised. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, so there's one question in the chat, which is from uh, Rebecca. So Rebecca is asking: As these waterfront sites get developed, are there any partner programs for providing swim lessons? or other water safety training in the communities. So, um, Brahana, do you want to answer that quickly about water safety, <clears throat> specifically what's happening in the city and some of the initiatives on water safety? Absolutely. Yeah, happy to happy to share some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, initiatives and, and legislation that's out there. Um, we are essentially supporting the Water Safety Coalition um, that is looking at creating a couple of things in order to provide more water safety around New York City. One is to provide students with um, access to materials on water safety around uh, around the city. So this would be uh, developed by DOE and provided by DOE to, to students and schools. Um, the other uh, the other initiative that is uh, that we're hoping to establish um, is this idea of creating a lifeguard core um, among among young people as well. So getting young people engaged in becoming uh, lifeguards um, in, in the hopes that we can now start to uh, start to establish um, stronger. Uh, stronger sort of um, workforce and, and, and sort of pathways into uh, providing that kind of safety around the city. And then finally, one of one of the key things is to try to establish more more swim programs at schools. Um, and uh, and at the very, very basics coming from an immigrant community myself, you know, it is we don't we it, it's very difficult to uh, to have access to to swim lessons and it's very costly. And so having that kind of free um, access is, is critically important. So completely appreciate the uh, the question. And there are some initiatives out there. Happy to share more. Can I jump in for something too quickly? So I think in yeah. the evaluation criteria for the project, we also looked at proximity to CSOs and the volume of output of the CSOs to start thinking about uh, primary contact versus secondary contact. And we didn't think necessarily of offering swimming at locations or as a programming item, but certainly there could be at different locations around the city, there's a variety of swims and swim events and things that take place around the city. Um, to answer the question specifically, I think though swim lessons tend to be in pools indoor in specific environments and not necessarily on open water. Um, However, there might be locations that do that. So yeah, so, but as far as other water safety trainings that were listed in the question, I think all of our on water recreational human powered boating programs have a variety of safety training that they put their volunteers through and their guides and others. So training and instruction and lessons and, you know, to tap into Annette's uh, vigilance around the concept of safety that happens all the time. Um, so that is something that happens at different access points around the city. Great. Thank you. Okay, and we have one last question, which is, does the long-term vision for any of these sites include making these waters clean and safe for swimming? So I think this kind of gets back to what Ray was saying, which was that almost none of the sites had partner organizations that were specifically interested in swimming as an option. One thing, though, that we do look at, as Ray was talking about, is, is we do look at the proximity to the combined sewer overflows, which is the primary source of pollution that does, does prevent swimming from taking place in different parts of the city. So I think the concept that we want to impart most of all in all of this is that to do on water access, if it includes swimming or kayaking, you know, all of the, the whole range of activities, it really requires prioritizing the locations where there's the greatest need, where people have the least access to these improvements that have been taking place in other parts of the wealthier parts of, of New York City or New Jersey. And then at the same time, making sure that there's an organization or community interest to provide the, the, the 
the people power, the thing that makes it work because you really cannot do public access programs in the right way or provide public access without that connection to a community organization or a nonprofit or a volunteer organization that wants to do the amazing work that you just saw today. And, and especially that commitment to safety, which is so critical and so important and is very, very expensive uh, thing to, to ask for um, to happen on its own. It, it, you know, it would require an incredible amount of infrastructure in order for, in order to make a site 100% safe without that, without that human touch that's provided by the nonprofits and the community organizations and the volunteers who make it all work. So I guess that's the way I would I would answer that question. So with that, we're one minute over time and I just wanna thank all of our guests. So Annette and Michael and Ray, so much for being a part of all this. There's so much work to do. A thousand or more linear miles of waterfront of just the five boroughs of New York City and Northern New Jersey. And so many of the, these locations really need the attention that uh, they unfortunately are not getting. So we're hoping that this webinar moves a little bit in that direction. So thanks again. Thanks to everybody for joining. And if you have any other questions in the future, please feel free to reach out. Have a great Friday and have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.